Hello and welcome to Chris's Retro Corner. I'm Chris, this is my Retro Corner, and this is my Commodore 16. Let's, uh, let's get that to a slightly better viewing angle. Please excuse the squeakiness of this video. Um, we won't be staying with the polystyrene for very long. This Commodore 16, or to give it its full name, Commodore Series 264 Model 16, but more on that in a, in a little while, um, comes to me courtesy of a very kind donation from a good friend of mine uh, called Darren. So I'd like to thank him again um, very much um, for giving me this fantastic example of this 80s 8-bit micro. There's a lot of very interesting information here available on YouTube uh, about the Commodore machines that came out after the 64. So I'll link a few uh, resources and, and bits and pieces down in the description if you'd like to, to dig a little deeper. But just quickly, the Commodore 16 was released in 1984 and it's one of several machines that Commodore were planning uh, in their 264 series of computers. Um, these were, were in the very late stages of development at the very same time that Jack Trammell, the founder of Commodore International and later the Atari Corporation, promptly left Commodore um, in January 1984. So without clear steer and after Jack's departure, it seems that Commodore struggled to understand uh, their intended demographic for these machines. Um, presented uh, three computers to a somewhat confused marketplace and in the result um, the three computers of the uh, 264 series, that is the um, Commodore 16, the sort of rubber keyed entry level model um, designed to directly compete with the Sinclair Spectrum. The 16 that we have here, which was intended to replace the now aging uh, VIC-20, uh, and then the Plus 4 with its four inbuilt pieces of, uh, sort of software on ROM, um, aimed at the more serious home computer user, they, they failed to capture the user base that ensured the success of Commodore's previous home computers. The C16 was considered somewhat of a flop at the time, um, if sales figures were anything to go by, certainly in the US, um, where, it, where it's actually withdrawn from sale within a year of going to market. Um, however, it did fare better in here in the UK, um, the rest of Europe, uh, and also in Mexico, where it was sold between 1985 and 1992, so that's actually quite a long time. And it was sold as like a, an entry-level computer. Um, the, the 264 series has a pretty active sort of homebrew community, um, and most of the software being made for the 16K RAM version, so that's the, the 116 and the 16 um, had 16K. Um, and there was it's kind of very little support, unfortunately, for the 64K in the Plus 4. Um, however, there's a, a good handful of new games being released each year, and also several titles being ported in from other platforms that never saw release uh, on this uh, back in the day. So let's, uh, let's, let's take this out and have a quick look. Very quickly, we'll pop that over there for a second. Like I said, we've got the manuals as well, which is pretty awesome, and I dare say I'll be referring back to those at some point really soon. Um, the power supply. Let's uh, let's preemptively plug this in. It might seem like a bold step, but with a little bit of luck, we might be using that later. Um, and then the RF cable. I haven't taken the RF cable out of this case, and as you can see, um, as time has, has worked its uh, the progression here, uh, the leads have sort of carved lines where the rubber's reacted with the polystyrene into the case. Um, and I, I took the took the put the power supply out, and it, it, it kind of was, it was weird. It was, it was stuck. I haven't touched this yet, so you see exactly what I mean as I take this out. Okay. So you're ready for this? Oop, squeaky again. You ready for this? Let's have a let's have a closer look. Oh, that's not too bad that bit, but can you see it's stuck at the bottom? Oh dear. Oh, and then this is going to be the this is going to be the worst bit. Oh dear. Look at the look at the mess left behind by that. But there we go. So that's all out. I'm not actually using this. I'm going to use a cable that's tried and tested and trusted. So we'll pop that over there. 
and let's get rid of this. Turning our attention back to the Commodore 16, let's have a let's have a, a look around it first, shall we? So if I bring this up into into sharp focus, where are we? There we go. We can see, like the Vic 20, it's got function keys down the side, but there are one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's seven and a help and a help function on the top. So that's a little different. Dedicated cursor keys, um, again a little different. Uh, an escape key. Yeah, that's that's new. But everything else kind of looks very similar. I, I mean, even assuming there was there's a lot of the same tooling being used um, for this. So let's uh, let's let's wander around. Let's have a let's have a quick look. So here you can see the joystick ports, not the normal um, DB9 ports that you might find sort of the Atari standard. Um, but a little bit more on those later. So joystick one and two, the reset button, so that's handy. You don't get that on a Commodore 64 or VIC-20 unless you've modded it slightly. Um, the the on-off switch there, um, and the power socket, very small. Look like we've standardised on a barrel connector there. So looking uh, looking along the back there, um, you've you've got uh, I say the I say the cartridge slot, but also the uh, the 16 and in fact the 264 series had a dedicated um, floppy disk drive that made made use of this at much higher speed um, than the 1541s and the likes. Um, so that's the cartridge port, the RF out here, so TV modulator behind here. Um, we've got video here, and that's compatible with the lead that I've already got, which is which is handy. Um, we've got serial, and that's compatible um, with existing uh, Commodore drivers of the time. And then we've got the data set port here. You'll note there's no user port. Um, so yeah, the C C16 was uh, was missing the user port. Nothing on that side. Nothing noteworthy on the front. Quick look. Quick look. Just on just on that side there. Um, not much information there. Just a, other than the uh, than the series and the model, just there. And of course, I'm guessing the serial number. Well, yes, it says, it says serial number there. So yeah, that's uh, that's the quick look around. So yeah, um, so it is it is interesting that uh, the Commodore swapped out um, sort of the the nine pin ports for smaller ones. Um, you can understand it on the plus four. So the uh, the one one six, the sixteen, um, and the plus four, all part of the same series. Remember, um, they did have they did have these different ports for the for the joystick. They did have different power sockets as well. Um, and again, the uh, the data set port there, um, all sort of diminished or sort of uh, sub miniature size, as it were. Um, but yeah, what what. What happened there really um, is that it created incompatibilities with these ports uh, unless converters or adapters were used, which meant that upgrading users, um, especially from the uh, 64, um, were forced to buy new hardware um, and they couldn't reuse what they already had. Um, However, more importantly, the internal hardware um, of the 264 series computers was not backwardly compatible with what was a vast software library um, that supported the Commodore 64. Um, given the poor sales of these devices, um, software developers seemed reluctant to invest time, money and effort in producing software for these computers. Um, and so there, there wasn't much about the software library just wasn't just wasn't great for these machines. Um, all these factors likely contributed to what seems to be the ultimate failure of this range of computers. Like I say, I still consider myself exceptionally happy um, and grateful to have to have this one because um, it, it fills the gap in my uh, my Commodore range um, absolutely beautifully. Um, so yeah, look, like I say, there's a good homebrew and supporting market for these. Um, and so, yeah, really looking forward to getting to grips with this. However, before I can do that, I do want to look inside, um, just, see, just see if I can see any lurking problems before hopefully I try firing this up. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's, have a, let's have a look about. So 
here we go. It looks like this is likely the very first time this has been opened um, since it's come out of the factory. It really does look um, and, and kind of smell. When you open the box, you get that wave of, of fresh electronics. Darren's taken really good care of this, so I'm ever so grateful to him. Um, but yeah, you get that nice smell of new electronics. I don't even know how that's possible, but, uh, but yeah, here we go, here we go. I'm assuming it's hinged at the back, like the uh, Vic, my Vic 20 and the, the later 64s are, and indeed it is. So fantastic. Let's let's try and remember the, the reds on the left and blacks on the right. We we'll take that off. Pop that over there. Um, we will be very careful with our uh, keyboard port. It seems to be at a slight angle. Actually, I don't know. Don't know if you can see that. Um, but we'll be uh, be careful taking that off. There we go. I think that's I think that's done. And we shall pop pop the top just over to the side. And that leaves us with the board there. So you can see that the board's pretty small, actually. Um, sort of back in the day, um, the the breadbin style Commodore 64s and the Vic 20s, they filled this. You can see we've even still got the uh, the moulding holes there for the for the screws, um, for the corner. Um, the cost reduced versions of those boards. Uh, my 64 is a cost reduced version. Um, and the, uh, the later VIC 20s, and indeed my mind's a uh, cost reduced VIC 20 as well, it was quite late on, um, are using these these bosses here a little bit further back. So, very, very small, very compact board. Um, so, as we as we look about this, I'm interested to see what the uh, assembly number is. We'll just sort of point that out here. So, that number there. Um, the PCB number as well, revision B uh, of that particular number. Um, so I will look that up and see where that lies in the in the grand scheme of things. Was it early? Was it late? Who knows? Um, like I say, uh, the Commodore 16 came out in 1984, and this has indeed got 1984 written on the board. Um, so yeah, it wasn't a particularly long-lived uh, computer, other than in Mexico, where it seemed to do relatively well. Um, so yeah. Be, be interesting to try and to try and figure out um, sort of where this where this board lies with it. I also need those numbers um, to make sure that when I when I do recap this board and I will um, because capacitors do go out of tolerance over a period of time. Um, yeah, that'll be really helpful when I uh, when I try and source a, a cap kit for that. So, having a quick look around the board, um, this this is our CPU. And this is the this is the thing that, that seems to die the most on these computers. Um, you don't hear good stories about the TED chip here either. Um, but the more I read, the more I speak to people, it it seems that it's almost always this chip. Worst luck. Um, so, in the hope that this fires up in just a little while, I've got myself a little heatsink. I will t I will attempt if it all looks okay, and it's starting to already. I'm just casting my eye across the top of the board here and just checking the tops of the capacitors. Everything looks shiny, completely devoid of dust, gunk, goo, anything horrid like that. A little bit of dust actually. Oh, I lied. Um, assuming it all it all looks okay, when I take the board out and have a snoop around that in a second, I will pop that on there. Uh, well, I'll fire it up just for a second, just for a second, just to see if it does anything. Um, and then pop that on there, and hopefully that chip might. Uh, well, the heatsink might save that chip. We'll see. So, like I said, this is the CPU, and this one here's the TED chip. And the TED chip's pretty interesting um, because it does sound, video, um, it processes keyboard and joystick uh, inputs as well, and it does some RAM functions and counter control as well. So it's it's uh, almost like a, a little forerunner of having like a system on a chip. Um, that you might find in your Raspberry Pi nowadays. Raspberry Pi, wow, I thought this was a retro channel. It is, but yeah, I like those too. So, um, yeah, let's have, a, let's have a quick look. Take the board out, have a quick snoop around it. So here we go. Pop that out of the way for a second, just over there. And then we'll have a good look around the board. So like I say, I'm checking the tops 
of all the capacitors, uh, electrolytic capacitors, ordinarily, and I can't see too many marks on these, although there may be faint lines, um, are designed to, to fail um, by uh, the, the cap of the can, the top of the can there, um, just releasing pressure that may build up um, as the capacitor fails during operation. And it looks to me like that's all OK. Quick look at the fuse, a bit hard to see, I might test that in a second. We'll pop, pop that over. That there looks a little bit like solder flux, so it's probably okay. Doesn't look like it's doing anything to traces. Very, um, yeah, very clean under here. Uh, again, likely solder flux. Definitely. That I think I, I'm sure I read somewhere not long ago that that's basically like thread lock. That's uh, that's holding on this uh, this heat sink here for that transistor. So. Um, so yeah, that's just a bit of thread lock, so I'm not going to fuss about that. I'm sure that's absolutely fine and inert. And yeah, it looks, it looks very nice indeed underneath. So, not much we can, not much we can do. I think I'm pretty convinced the switch sounds okay. Just make sure it's in the off position. Spoil our fun later when we go to switch that on. Um, but yeah, we'll just just check there's uh, there's continuity there on that fuse. I shall lift one side. I don't know which side looks uh, better to do. Help, possibly. If I had that, uh, maybe on resistance and not voltage. Fuse is okay. Good. And so back that goes. And we'll stick that on voltage because we will need that again very shortly. With a little bit of luck. So quick snoop around the board. Um, I will learn a little bit more about what chips these are, um, PLAs, that, that sort of thing, CIAs. Do they have CIAs in this? Probably not. Somebody correct me. Um, RAM chips and logic over here, I guess, and there's, there's very little very little. Um, so yeah, let's pop that back in the case and uh, we're, we're one step further on to, uh, to firing this up. Okay, grab the keyboard back again. Now how come that stood up all on its own earlier and now it won't? Doesn't matter slow and carefully. So that was there. And remember uh, red was on the left. It would have been more helpful if red was on the right. Doesn't matter. Red was on the left. Um, and then of course we've got the keyboard connector as well. So it was at a slight angle. So let's uh, see if we can see if we can do this carefully. It would help if you could see the tiny little pins in the light. There we go. We're there and that's on. So very carefully uh, popping this back in these these hinges. These hinges at the back here are terrible for, for snapping off. Um, and especially the, the later model plastics as well um, didn't seem to be quite as thick perhaps. So I do want to try and be very careful with those and just make sure they're well aligned, which they almost were. Oop. Poke you back in. Be gone. There you are. And it was only the three screws across the front, so let's pop those back in. Right, there we go. So, has anybody spotted my rookie error? Yes, I'm glad you did. The heatsink. So, yep, I've put the three screws in, I've put the case back together again, and there's a strong chance I'll need to undo that and put that back on. If it fires up, 
I say it's a strong chance it might well not be. So there we go. Um, maybe I'll cut that bit out later so you don't have to see it again. Right. So there we go. Um, voltage voltage tester. Let's uh, let's pop that in here. Now this is supposed to be 9.5 volts. So uh, can we see that on camera? 9.5 volts. Let's have a look. Wow, that's high. Hmm. 14.82. Now that does seem high, doesn't it? Hmm. I'm going to go away. I'm going to do some finding out. And I'll be back again shortly. Let's pop this over here. Out there. And I'll see you in a sec. So, I've done my finding out. And that voltage is fine. Um, it's an unregulated supply, so not like it's switched like current ones. Um, so yeah, the voltage will be a little high um, and it's internally regulated by the Commodore 16. So yeah, phew, <laughs> we can carry on. So yeah, why not? Let's let's do it. So we will get enough cable so that we can plug this in. that in the video port. There we go. Double check that we are indeed off and give this some power. And yeah. So let's uh, let's pop the tally on. channel which I hope is that one and here we go here we go here's the uh, here's the tester this is this is this is where my plan could go horribly wrong um, so three two one power anything doesn't look like it let's pop it on the other <gasps> it's there look quick turn it off turn it off did you see that I saw that she lives. Fantastic stuff. Great. Ah, brilliant. Right. And this is where that comes in. So now I've got to take it apart again. So I'll see you in a bit and I'll do that quickly. Right. So there we go. Back in and we will pop this on here really quick let's see uh, let's see if we let's see if we can't get a temperature of that already is that right 24 degrees go up and down there a little bit looks like it's okay 24 what's the ambient temperature let's find something let's find something else 24 well there you go who knew who knew it's about 24 degrees. <laughs> right. Well, that's a, that's a result. So, yeah, we didn't even warm it up above ambient by the looks of things, which is nice. Um, just a, just a, a quick one. Just a quick shout out to Retroleum. Um, I'll pop a link down in the description. Um, I've got lots of little bits. Um, they particularly support um, the Commodore and uh, Sinclair range of computers. Um, and, yeah self-adhesive uh, heatsink very reasonably priced um, and what's nice about um, what Phil does at uh, Retroleum is that it gives you everything you need so I've got the uh, self-adhesive got the self-adhesive uh, heatsink there I've got some, uh, some alcohol wipes to uh, to clean off the top of the CPU and um, I've got some little instructions as well so if I didn't know what I was doing and I'll be honest, I do not profess to. Um, yeah, gives you a little, little instructions as about, about how to go about that. So yeah, great service, highly recommended. Right, let's get on with this then.
okay I need to align this carefully so yeah so you're gonna end up with my head in the way at some point soon I'm quite nervous about doing this I don't even know why let's get some uh, some specs on so we can get up close to the action using my fingernail as a guide there to, uh, to pop this on. I think we're nicely centered. Firm pressure for 15 seconds. There we go. Splendid stuff. See, hopefully, hopefully that CPU will live to uh, to last uh, a little bit longer. Sneaky preview. I'm going to take this out and pop that in my plus four at some point, so I can test whether or not a, a working CPU gets my plus four working as well, um, and then replace that with another one. If it does, if it doesn't, it's got to be something else. So it's part. Is this going to become part of the uh, the troubleshooting process for my plus four as well? Yeah, let's pop this back together again. Red on the left, wasn't it? Was it? Yes, it was. Of course, it was. So let's pop these back in again. Make sure we're still off, of course. Bit of power. And let's bring something new into the equation because we're going to need it. So if you saw the unboxing video, you know what's in here. So it's not going to come as a surprise to find the data set. Remember the data set's got a, a particularly unique plug to it. So we will need that. And this is where my this is where my extended plan could come um, a little bit unstuck. We could be uh, we could be left with the data set not working. Um, the rubber bands in these, the drive belts, not rubber bands, they're drive belts, um, for the counter and of course for the uh, for the actual mechanism um, can sometimes become tarry sticky goo um, at worst and at best mm, loosen and slacken. The, you know, this, this data set will have been sat dormant for the last sort of 30 years. Um, so, uh, so yeah, or thereabouts. Um, so yeah, it, it might not work. But fingers crossed it will, so we'll find out. Um, I forgot to mention, the, uh, the 264 Ranger computers came with an enhanced version of BASIC. So uh, yeah, if anyone's seen the old um, VIC-20 and the 64 introduction to BASIC parts 1 and 2, where, you've, where you can find them, um, yeah, this is, this is new. This is new BASIC. So uh, we'll come back to that at some point in the future. Zap. There we go. This is what we're. This is what we're getting to. This is what we're getting to. Um, so yeah, you are a lone zapper. Is that right? Uh, last survivor of an advanced civilization. Many centuries ago, your planet uh, was besieged by alien hordes. Now only you remain. Fantastic. <laughs> right. So, basic, basic games. Quick, straight to the games. Let's pop these back. Maybe I should keep these out because I've got no idea how to play this. I think it's just basically shoot everything. I'll leave that to one side. <laughs> it might come in, might come in helpful. But for the time being, we shall pop this away and out of the way. So, leaving everything off, we will plug in our data set. Looks like a looks like an old PS2 mouse or keyboard. Could be the same connector. I don't know. Looks like it goes that way, and it does. Oh yeah. Forgot to say the uh, there's a considerable amount of the case on those cables. <laughs> um, so at some point I will clean those off. 
So, here we go, here we go. Switch it on, and it's there. See, told you it's a different version of basic, 3.5. Um, just, just over 12K available to use in basic, and it's a stunning picture on there. Even if it's an LCD, it's, at least it's the right size spec ratio, at least it's 4 by 3 um, But yeah, great picture on there. So, I guess the moment of truth. All right, pop the cassette in. If it does load, I, I will be certain to uh, I'll be certain to um, speed it up for you. I'm not going to expect to sit here for two and a half minutes or so while that loads. Actually, it's 16k. It could be, it could be quite quick. All right, fingers crossed. Rewind, because it does look like Darren's been using that. Can you see that? Yeah, you can. Let's see if I can zoom in. Well, there we go. Watch the tape counter go back. Oh, yeah, the tape counter's working. The mechanism. <gasps> I forgot to mention. I just expect these things to work, and it does. And it does. You might note I'm actually quite excited now. <laughs> and I am. I am. Um, absolutely amazing. Right, other things we need. Oh, I'm going to have to turn this off and on again, aren't I? So what I've got is got a joystick adapter. So fortunately very cheap. Um, but yeah, you can get them. And they convert the regular Atari style 9 pin to uh, the more... Uh, more peculiar let's say format of the c16 so that stopped is that supposed to click who knows reset the tape counter that went down to 20 from wherever it was 279 or something so that's really close um i'm surprised that's working but brilliant stuff okay so let's switch let's switch this off pop in a joystick old faithful here old faithful from back in the day um don't know if this works actually cool sorry sorry so yeah it's a whole bunch of firsts going on at the moment which is really exciting so uh, thank you for joining me along the ride okay here we go here we go pop this in joystick one let's assume lovely pop the computer on wow still working <laughs> heart heart attack there almost wouldn't it be wouldn't it be amusing if it just stopped anyway uh right oh yeah different different commands shift run stop searching for device not present or error oh this is going to be a this is going to be a jump cut until i know what i'm doing so i'm going to go and read how to use this so i, I thought i thought you could literally just do that hmm back in a bit so seems I need to type the word load <laughs> press enter um, play on tape and then uh, and then the Commodore logo when it says it's found a program so let's try it load play on tape awesome good so far searching so we'll, we'll hover our finger over the uh, over the Commodore key <laughs> and hopefully it finds something has indeed found something look at that press the Commodore key and it'll carry on loading but we'll let that run and uh, and I'll see you in a moment or two okay I don't think we're getting very far with this it's really counted up quite a long way now so I don't think this is working so good so rewind Let's pop that up there I am going to run stop shift run stop What just happened there? Okay, so I still need to learn what I'm doing with this. <laughs> oh dear. Do excuse me. It's a learning process. You're learning with me. I'm learning this computer. Um, so there we go. How very strange. I'm. It must have loaded the program, made it, whether it only just made it or not. I don't know. I'll, I'll do it again later. Um, but it's loaded. So this was working after all. And I strongly suspected it wasn't. So there we go. So zap on on the on the Commodore 16. I didn't know it was working. Um, absolutely, absolutely sensational. Okay, all right. So I, I think basically it's uh, 
it's just a case of me saying uh, thank you very much for joining me um, appreciate you watching thank you um, and, I, and I do look forward to seeing you in another video again soon in the meantime I'm gonna try and get to grips with zap and probably die horrendously so what it didn't say is that you need the joystick in port 2 so let's give that another go I'm still gonna be rubbish <laughs> let's give it another go Ooh. And there we go. That was quick, wasn't it? <laughs>